here's, here's what we're going to do. We haven't talked much about object-oriented programming yet, although we've been using it to some extent. Like when we had this line, scanner sc equals new scanner system.in, right? And then you don't have to type these notes. These are notepad, not a program, unless you just feel like it. This is called a reference variable because it's not a primitive value like a number, right? An int is a primitive type. It's just pure numbers, right? Or a float, or a double, or a long. Any of those things are just primitive values. But a scanner is a complex thing, right? A scanner can read input from a keyboard. It's got to be really complex in order to be that. Well, this is called a class right there. Scanner is a class. And when we use the new keyword followed by the, the name of a class, it creates an object. So we have a scanner object. And then the reference to that, the address of it, gets stored in the variable so that we can use it. We can call it sc.nextline or it's, you know, next double or next int or whatever. <coughs> so what does that line do? This creates an object of type scanner and stores a reference to it. I guess I could actually be putting this in our Java. Why don't we? Aratia. New project, making an ant. If you're using your own. Lecture K, it looks like. Well, no, I'm not going to type that in. Uh, we'll type it in a minute. It stores a reference to that object. The reference just means address, right? I have a house, and if I want you to get to my house, I give you my address. I'm not giving you my house, but I'm giving you an address. Right? And if you want to use a scanner, you need to know its address, so it gets stored in a variable. Okay, but we can make our own classes, like this, a class, a patient. We're going to keep track of patient, lots of people in the medical field. And a patient has a first name, right, and a last name, that's an F and that's an L. Now when we want to use that class down in main, we would do something like this. And I am going to type this into our code. Class, or excuse me, patient p1 equals new patient. Parentheses in, parentheses in, and I could set the first name and the last name like this. And I'm going to type it again into Java. p1.name, or p1.f name equals Bob, in quote. p1.l name equals Roberts. Right, so now one variable is being used to access two pieces of information. Previously, we've only held one piece of information per variable. We could put a hundred different things in here. We could put the patient's address and their birth date and their temperature and their ad, you know, all sorts of stuff. Well, let's go and make a class. Once you make your Java file, every class should go in its own file. Having said that, I'm not going to do it. But every class should go in its own file. The only reason I'm doing it in the same file is so that I can be able to scroll up and down and see it. So do this. Class patient. Put this right underneath the package statement. I forgot to remove the package this time. Right above public class. Class patient. Curly brace. A patient has a name. So string space name semicolon. A patient has a birth date. String birth date. And a patient has an address. String address. Semicolon. Please spell string correctly, unlike me. I keep forgetting to swap out the keyboards. All right, let's create some patients. By the way, if you were doing C++ programming, you'd just need to put a semicolon there. A couple other changes, but... So, patient p1 equals new p1. 
patient, parentheses, in parentheses. Patient P2 equals new patient, parentheses, in parentheses. For some reason, a font looks small to me today. Maybe too big. So now we've created patients and we can assign some values to it. P1.name equals quote Donald Duck, end quote, semicolon. P1.birthday equals, you know, 01 slash 02 slash, when, I don't know when Donald's first appearance was, 1920, end quote. Parentheses. And P1 dot address equals quote Disney World. End quote. Let's put some more information in the other patient. P2 dot name equals quote Bugs Bunny. End quote semicolon. P2 dot birth date. Again, I have no idea, so I'm going to say that he was born on 06 slash 07 slash 1936. End quote, semicolon. And that was supposed to be birth date rather than birthday, so I'm going to edit to be correct. And P2 dot address, he lives in a, in a rabbit hole. Or 123 South Carrot Lane end quote, semicolon. So one variable is holding these three pieces of data, and another variable is holding these three pieces of data. Now that's about as far as I'm going to take the idea right now, except I want to be able to print this information out easily. I want to be able to say p1.print, parentheses, in parentheses, and have it print all that. Now notice it's underlined. We can't do that yet because we don't have a print method but I want there to be one. And I want to be able to call p2.print, parentheses, in parentheses. To get that to work, I'm going to have to go back to the patient class and add a print method. It doesn't need to return anything because there's no equal sign. It doesn't need any parameter variables because there's nothing between the parentheses. And so if it doesn't return anything, it's declared of type void, just like we see there. OK, so up here underneath string address before the curly brace. Void space print parentheses in parentheses. Open curly brace, closed curly brace, and inside here do system dot dot out dot print f. Something wrong there. Print f open parentheses quote percent s space percent s space percent s backslash in, comma, and let's print those variables out. This dot name, comma, this dot birth date, comma, this dot address, in parentheses, semicolon. And you don't have to put it, you know, you don't have to put a, a line break like there, like I did. So this is a method, and a method is a function that's attached to a class. So Java doesn't have functions, unlike C++ and Python, because everything is part of a class. Every function you create is inside a class. Main is inside a class. Print is inside a class. You cannot create a function that's not inside a class in this language, unlike Python and C++. Just set. All right. So now when it runs, it should print out Donald Duck and his address and all that. And it should print out Bugs Bunny and his address. We could make this fancier, right? You know, we could say name equals percent s 
birth date equals percent s, address equals percent s. And let's run it. Hammer and room it, green arrow. There it goes. Donald Duck's birthday is that, and his address is Disney World. Bugs Bunny's birthday is that, and his address is 123 South Carolina. So that's what's cool about classes, is that a class, an object, a class is a definition, a blueprint for a collection of data, and the methods, the functions that act on that data. And we can add as many functions as we wanted to, as many methods as we wanted to. We could add as many pieces of data as we wanted to. And so one variable, P1, is referencing three pieces of data. And if we want to do something with it, we just say P1 dot, followed by the method name. Now, right now, we only have one method, but we can go and add more. Anybody need typo correction? Are we all good? So let's get PowerPoint open. All right, so if you want to print OK if the temperature is between 50 and 90, you'd use an AND, except you'd use ampersands, right, in this language. So if temperature greater than or equal to 50 and the temperature is less than or equal to 90, OK, well, our programming language does not have that cute single letter character symbol. So we'd have to write it something like this, right? If temp greater than or equal to 50, Ampersand, ampersand, temp, less center, equal to 90, in parentheses, you know, system dot out dot print line. Okay. Like that. That's how we would do that. Else, print, not okay. The program on the next slide determines whether fans at a baseball game win free french fries. If the home team wins and scores at least 100 points, then the program prints this message. Redeem your ticket stub for a free order of french fries at Yummy Burgers. All righty. So our poor basketball players have to earn at least 100 points. Now here we go. What are we doing? We're going to ask them for the score earned. Then we're going to ask what the opponent, opponent team earned. And we're going to figure out whether they won or not. Well, let's do that. Let's go and add that code if you feel like it. So we're going to need a home team and the opponent. Let's use their variable names if they're short. So int home points and int opponent, I hate that long variable name, points. We need a scanner to ask this for this information. So we're going to have to add an import for the scanner. Scanner sc equals new scanner parentheses system dot in in parentheses semicolon capital S. I'm going to scroll up to the top and add my import. Although, of course, NetBeans will do it for us. So above the package statement, import lowercase java dot util dot asterisk semicolon. Ooh, I guess it needed to be after the package statement. Well, I'm really annoyed with having a package statement in here at all, so I'm going to delete the word package, and I'm going to make NetBeans fix it. So I'm going to come up here. Now that I've deleted the package, I have to click on that and say move class to correct folder. All right, now I can go back down to my scanner. All right, let's ask them. System.out.print, parentheses quote, how many points did 
did the home team score? Question mark. Space, space, end quote, parentheses, semicolon. And let's find out. Home points equals sc dot next i and t, capital I, parentheses, in parentheses. Same business to get the opponent score. I should have called it like other team rather than opponent. It'd be easier to type. System.out.print, parentheses, quote. How many team points did the other team score? Question mark, space, space. End quote, semicolon. Opponent points equals sc.next, capital I, int, parentheses, in parentheses, semicolon. Oh, now I've got a problem already. Let me guess. I spelled opponent wrong. Not a statement. Oh, what did I do wrong? Anybody spot the error? I blame my keyboard, which doubles keys. Two equals? Yeah, two equals. I guess one equal. All right, so our conditions is if we won and we scored 100 points, we get free fries. Let's write an if statement that does that. But first, we need to find out if we won. How do we know that? Home points greater than opponent points. So if, parentheses, home points greater than opponent points, ampersand, ampersand. So if, if we won, home points is greater than opponent points, and our home points greater than or equal to 100, in parentheses, we're going to print our, get a free, you know, system.out.println. Here's a coupon for free fries. Exclamation mark, end quote, parentheses, semicolon. And I guess we ought to tell them, sorry, maybe next time. So else, system.out.println. Parentheses. Sorry, no coupon this time. Period. End quote in parentheses semicolon. So we're going to run the program. How many points did Holden T score? Well, we scored 100. The other team scored 90. So we should definitely get our our free fries. Yep. Now let's run it again and make the other team win. How many points did the home scheme team score? Well, we scored a nice 100, but unfortunately they scored 106. Sorry, no chief on this time. Now let's run it one more time and test what happens if we won but we didn't get enough points, right? Our team scored 99. They scored 98. We did win but we didn't get 100 points, so sorry, no coupon this time. All right, I'm going to pause it, make sure we're all together. So that's what AND means, is both of them. And the OR operator is true if one side or the other is true. Now this is a horrible example because it, this flat out doesn't work. And the reason why is both sides have to be an entire expression. There's no language that lets you say if response equals this or this. You would have to say if response equals that or response equals that. And of course, in all of our languages, we'd actually use double equals, right? There. Now that's better. If response is equal to a lowercase q or the response is equal to an uppercase q, then print goodbye. 
So in Java, we have to fluff out the syntax a little bit with our nice parentheses and dot equals. So if response dot equals a lowercase q, or response dot equals uppercase q, then print goodbye. It's a common bug to forget to repeat the variable. You can't do this, although it looks great. If response.equals lowercase q or uppercase q, I wish it worked. It doesn't. You have to repeat the name of the variable each time. So this is correct. Response equals lowercase q or response equals uppercase q. This is not correct. So as an alternative to using or, to check for both uppercase and lowercase, you can use equals ignore case. And we talked about that last time, right? Because I wanted you to check to see if the name entered was equal to your name. So we use equals ignore case. If the response dot equals ignore case Q, then print it print out by. So we don't have to have an or statement if we're ignoring the case. On the other hand, maybe we want to let them type in the word quit, right? So we could do this. or response equals, you know, the word quit, something like that. Then we're checking to see, we're letting them type in either a single letter or the whole word. And the not logical operator just reverses the truthiness of it. Now it usually makes the writing, the uh, program harder to read if you word it this way. But if the reply is an uppercase Q or a lowercase Q, but nope, we put a not in front of it. So if not, reply equals uppercase Q or lowercase Q, then print let's get started. So as long as they didn't type in an uppercase Q or a lowercase Q, it's going to come in here and print let's get started. So the not reverses it. If this is true or this is true, then that not would turn it into a false and it would not print let's get started. There's other ways of doing that, right? We could say if reply not equal to Q, we could do this. If reply not equal to Q and reply not equal to uppercase Q, right? Except we'd have to change that to an and, like that. There we go. <coughs> Same thing. To my mind, that's easier to read than the way it was written. You may disagree. You may like the way it was written. That's totally cool if you do. And the switch statement. Have we talked about switch statements in here? I'm getting very confused because I'm also teaching C++ and we just hit switch in it. Have we talked about switch in this class? Don't think so? Okay. The way switch works is it's like a great big series of if, else, if, else, if, else, ifs. So like this. What if we wanted to ask them for material and then we wanted to set the density based on what they typed in. Something like this. System.out.println, parentheses, quote, what material to use? Question mark, end quote, in parentheses, semicolon. Now they don't know what to type. So system.out.println, parentheses, quote, choices. AU, which stands for gold. FE, which stands for iron, and AL, which stands for aluminum. So let's get their choice. String material equals sc.next in print. Or we could put some numbers here, right? Make it easier for them to type. 1 equals AU, 2 equals FE, and 3 equals aluminum. So we could read it into a number, right? We don't have to read it into a string in that case. So I'm going to erase that and replace it. Int space material equals sc dot next capital I, int, parentheses, in parentheses. Now we can find the atomic mass of it. So we need a variable, double space mass, or atomic mass, a mass equals zero, and we're going to have a switch statement, which is just like if, else, if, else, if. Switch 
parentheses material in parentheses open curly brace inside the curly brace put case colon nope nope don't put case colon put case one colon material equals not two equals just one and wait 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 no not material the atomic mass a mass equals and I'm gonna have to look up at the mass of AU I don't have this table memorized so periodic chart periodic table all right what does aluminum weigh where is aluminum right there 26.982 so the atomic mass is equal to 26.982, semicolon. And then put a break statement. And I shouldn't have put these on the same line. So I'm going to hit enter there, and I'm going to tab that as well. All right, so that's if they typed a 1. What if they typed a 2? Case 2, colon. The atomic mass of iron is something else. So A mass equals, again, I'm going to have to look it up. Fe is 55.845. 55 55.845, semicolon, break. One more. Let's do the third example. Way. I said aluminum, and I put the wrong one here. This is the mass of aluminum. I'm going to have to go back in and fill this with the correct one. So I should be putting some comments here. This is gold. And that's not how you do comments in this language. That's Python. Slash slash AU parentheses gold. Case 2 slash slash FE parentheses iron in parentheses. And now case 3 which is aluminum, which actually is equal to that. Case 3, colon, which is AL, parentheses, aluminum. Or if we were British, we would say aluminium. I throw in an extra I. And the atomic mass of aluminum is what I had up there for case 1, 26.982, semicolon, break. Now what if they didn't type in any of them? We need to let them know that they didn't get a correct value. They chose something invalid. Better go back and get the right one for gold first though, right? Let's go find out what gold is. Ooh, it's much heavier than the others. That's why gold is so heavy. 196.97. 196.97. So, 196.97. But what if they didn't type in anything? We don't want to just leave mass zero, or maybe we do, you know, but we got to tell them they made a mistake. Default is like a, an else that handles everything else. So default colon, let's tell them they got it wrong. System.out.println parentheses quote, invalid choice using mass equals 100. Just some arbitrary value, right? End quote, in parentheses, semicolon, and then we can say a mass equals 100. And then a break. After that, we're just going to have a print statement to print out the atomic mass. So I'm going to come down here and put system.out.printf, parentheses, quote, the atomic mass, atomic mass to use is percent %f backslash n end quote, comma, a mass, in parentheses, semicolon. 
Or instead of saying use mass equals 100, we could just quit the program, right? Instead of invalid choice using mass is equal to 100, this is kind of mean, right? We should loop, but we're going to say invalid choice quitting program. In quote, in parentheses, semicolon. And then let's return out of the program, in which case we don't need a break statement. So that's the change that I just made. Just going to quit the program if they made it invalid choice. How rude. We really ought to loop, but it'll show the point. So you can see it's like an if, else, if, else, if. If the material is 1, then atomic mass is that. Else if the material is 2, the atomic mass is that. Else if the material is 3, the atomic mass is that. Now, could you use if, else, if, else, if? Yeah, you certainly could. And if you think if, if else, if, else, if makes the code clearer, than using a switch statement, go for it. But if you have like more than three choices, if you like have 40 choices or something like that, it's a lot better to use switch case. Just makes the code more structured. So what does break mean? Break means jump to the bottom of the switch. So as soon as the atomic mass gets set to 197, it comes down here and prints the atomic masses. If you didn't have the break, it would fall through and also set it equal to that. That would be wrong. If we chose gold, we don't want it to be set to iron or to aluminum. Let's run it and see what it does. And then I'll scroll back up for you if you didn't get the other part typed. All right. I have to answer these silly questions. They scored one. We scored one. What material to use? Iron. The atomic mass is 55.845. All right, so that's working. That's what a switch case is. It's like a big if statement. If the material is one, set it to that. If the material of two, it. Now comment out, if you've got all this typed in, comment out the break statements and watch what it does. Oops, I commented out the wrong things. Sorry. Com if you've got all this done, comment out the break statements and run it. And it blows up. OK, the reason it blows up is because atomic mass has never been set. My mistake. So I'm going to undo the last one. I'm going to eventually remove all those comments, so you really don't have to do this. But when I run it, no matter what I choose, it's going to say it's equal to 26.982. Right? One point. One point. Okay, so even if I choose gold, it's going to say it's 26. So why? Because it jumped to this case and it set it equal to 196, but there was no break. So it fell through and it did this one as well. And A mass became 55.845. And then it fell through again and, print, and set it equal to that. And so that's what it print. Now, obviously, that's not really what we want. But maybe there are times when we want that. Let's give an example of when we might want that. Oh, wait. I haven't checked to make sure everybody's got it. Yeah. You doing okay? Yeah.
Oh, that's true. We need these statements. Right here. Add those two. I'll be right back in. So we are going to have some homework based on this idea. We should take the example a little bit longer, farther. But here's what the homework's going to be. And Lindy may recognize it from C++. Write a program that asks for the diameter of a sphere, and then what material it is made of. And the program will calculate and print the mass. So here's how it's supposed to look. Welcome to the sphere mass calculator. And then it lists some sizes. Marble, golf ball, baseball, basketball, beach ball, or exercise ball. And then it says, what is the diameter of the sphere? Choose from one of the options above, and they choose C. So we're going to figure out how much the baseball weighs. Then it lists some materials. Is it made of ice, aluminum, gold, iron, wood, soil, paper, or osmium? Osmium is like the heaviest element, I think. It's even heavier than uranium. What is the material? Choose from the options above, C. And so it's going to figure out how much a baseball made out of gold is. Wish I had a baseball made out of gold. A sphere of that size and material has a volume of that and a mass of that. Weighs eight pounds if you had a gold baseball. So we need some information. These are the sizes to use. Show them all the sizes, and if they type in 1, set your diameter equal to 0 0.5. If they choose 2, set your diameter to 14.14. If they choose baseball, choose 0.24. If they choose basketball, use 0 0.80. Beach ball, 1.67, and exercise ball is 2.5 feet wide. So that's based on this menu. They choose that, and you set the diameter. So in this case, they choose baseball. The diameter is going to get set to 0.24 feet. But the equation is going to require radius. So you're going to need to create a variable that's equal to diameter divided by 2, right? Then we have a table of densities. Ice weighs 55 pounds per cubic foot. Aluminum weighs 168 pounds. Gold is incredibly heavy. It's, you know, 1,200 pounds per cubic foot. So, you know, if you're ever playing these games or you see a movie where they find a treasure chest of gold, we cannot imagine how much that gold would weigh, right? If it had two cubic feet in it, it would weigh 2,400 pounds. You wouldn't just put it on your shoulders and carry it out. Iron weighs 491 pounds per cubic foot. Cedar wood is 22. And soil dry is 80. 
Paper is 33 and osmium, the heaviest element, is 1400. So you're going to ask for the diameter. You're going to ask for the size. You're going to calculate the radius. And then you're going to use the radius to calculate the volume and to calculate the mass. So you'll have two switch statements. One to set the diameter equal to one of these values. And the other to set the material to one of these values. And what if they choose something wrong? You get to pick. Are you just going to quit the program? You're going to have a return statement like we did in here? Or are you going to you know, arbitrarily say, OK, we're going to use a baseball you know, or a, a foot or something? If they choose a bad density, are you going to make it quit the program? Or are you going to say, OK, well, we're just going to use gold right, or something? Yeah, you get to figure out what you want to do there. All right. That makes sense? Pretty good? All right. So what about using so-called fall through to do something useful? Because here it didn't do anything useful. Well, you know, if our phones, back in the old days, before we all had smartphones, before y'all were born, I'm kidding. Let's uh, look at this. Cell phone keypad. Looked kind of like this, right? And if you wanted to send somebody a text message and you wanted to send the word rose to somebody, you'd type seven three times, right? Seven, 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 and that would give you an R. And then an O would be a six, right? Excuse me, a six, you'd have to type in O three times. And an S, you'd have to type in seven four times. Well, vice versa. These were originally set up for different purposes back in the olden days, right? And they would give out phone numbers like Midwest City's code was RE, standing for Regent. And if you look it up, I mean, that was the magic word that you're supposed to know if you're going to call Midwest City. It's a word Regent, and you would take the first two letters. An R, seven. An E, three. Now you've done that the first two letters, right? So my phone number might be Regent 34567. So I would dial a 7 and a 3 and then a 34567. So what we might want to do is write a little program that will turn a letter into a number, right? So that we know that an R is a 7 and that a 3 is an E. Well, we can do that, and we can do that pretty quickly before the end of class. So let's make a comment. Convert a telephone prefix letter to a number, to a digit. So we need some kind of variable to hold our digit, right? Whether it's going to be an integer or a string, I don't know. Let's make it a string. String digit equals empty quotes, double quotes. Now let's ask for the letter. We need a string to hold the letter. And then we'll ask them for the prefix letter, and we'll use that to get our number. So system.out.print, parentheses quote, what is the prefix letter, question mark, space, space, end quote, in parentheses, semicolon. Now we need to let them type it in. String letter equals sc dot next, parentheses in parentheses. Now we're going to have a switch statement. It's going to be switch letter. And we're going to use the values that we see here, right? So if it's an A or a B or a C, we're going to set digit equal to 2. And if it's a D, E, or F, we're going to set digit equal to 3. So, switch parentheses letter in parentheses, curly brace, case, double quote A, end quote colon. But let's put more cases. Case quote B, 
int quote colon, case quote C, int quote colon. Notice that the telephone keypad doesn't use one, right? One doesn't have any letters. That's because one meant something very, very, very specific, a long distance call, right? So no phone number began with a one. So if it's an A or B or a C, our digit is two. Digit equals two, semicolon, break. I'm so sorry, I need to put quotes around the two because I had it up here as a string. So I'm gonna put quotes there. Let's do E, D, E, and F. Case, double quote D, end quote, colon. Case, double quote E, end quote, colon. And case, double quote F, end quote. Now, I listed these horizontally, but you don't have to. Don't change your code, but you could have done it like this, right? I could have done that. It would have just taken up more space. So I kind of like listing them like that. I'm going to undo that change. And so if it's a D, E, or an F, the digit equals quote three, end quote, semicolon. Now what if it's not equal to any of these? We need our break under that. So break, semicolon. And then how about default, colon? Default, we're going to print a message. System.out.println, system.out. dot print ln parentheses quote and let's make it print f print f parentheses quote percent f not a valid letter or prefix backslash n end quote comma letter and just for funsies Let's put apostrophes around the percent s. Apostrophe there and apostrophe there. Break. Or we could hit return, right? Quit our program. It'd be totally rude. We'll need to work on our etiquette, right? And start not just returning out of the program when we run into a problem. All right, now we can print the digit. That matches that. System.out.printf, parentheses quote, the prefix letter, or the prefix digit is, maybe we don't even need printf, right? Let's just do print ln. Print ln parentheses quote, missing my T. Print ln parentheses quote, the prefix digit is, Space, end quote, plus digit, parentheses, end parentheses, semicolon. All right, I still have to answer all these silly questions. Team score, one, one. What material to use, one. What is the prefix letter? A, and it should print two. And if I ran it again, and chose D or E or F, it would print three. What happens if I print a lowercase letter though? If I type in a lowercase a, what is it gonna say? Somebody give me a, a guess. If I type in a lowercase a, which of these cases is true? Uh, the default. Yep, and so it's gonna print not a valid prefix. Excellent gang, not a valid prefix. Well, let's fix that. I'm going to come back up here to this case and say case lowercase a colon, case lowercase b colon, case lowercase c colon, right? Now they can type in lowercase letters as well, except I've got some error. Oh, because I put single quotes around everything and it needed to be double quotes. My mistake, change them all to double quotes. like that. And I could do the same thing for D, E, and F.
Couldn't you do just like letter dot ignore case? Like well, I could, but I'm not doing any equals, right? Um, I could convert it to uppercase. You're right. I could get the uppercase version of it and then switch based on that. But there's nowhere I'm saying if letter dot equals. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you got the right instinct, but what I'd have to do is I'd have to convert it to an uppercase letter. Yeah, very good suggestion. Okay. So guess what your other homework assignment's gotta be? Yes, I'm a jerk and giving you two. It's to finish this program with the rest of the letters, right? Just carry it all the way out to Z. And I have one written up for that as well. Fine, I'll have to go and find it. I think I made... Parker, did I make the C++ class do the prefix, the letter prefix? Uh, I don't think so. All right, let's go look. I think so. I can check, though. I might be wrong. <laughs> we'll see. Well, I'm not seeing it. Maybe C sharp. Wait, no, I'm looking at the wrong place. All right. Text message key press converter, but that's not the one. That's the opposite of what we just did. Dag damn it. Well, you get the idea. Just complete that, right? Complete it all the way out to Z. But I really wanted to have the homework assignment in front of your eyes too. So let me find it. Keypad prefix translator. Here it is. Here's the instructions for it. Look at this old fashioned telephone dial. Back in the 50s, when telephone numbers went from five digits to seven, the phone company thought the seven would be too many. How can anybody possibly remember a seven digit phone number? So they assigned prefix codes. So if you said you were lived in Regent 74567, you were supposed to dial 7374567. Seven, so the assignment, write a program that will turn a prefix letter into a digit. If the user enters an R, it will display a 7. Now we've already got a good start on it, so you know the rest of it. And here's a little example, but that's C++. Looks remarkably the same, though. That makes sense, gang? Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll have two homework assignments based on this, these concepts using switch statements. The uh, density is going to be a little bit more challenging, not that much more, but this one's already all set up, right? We just have to add cases for for all the other letters and it'll work. All righty, let's go ahead and stop. Are there any questions? I don't ask that often enough. So in the second homework assignment, you want us to do it in uppercase and lowercase? Sure, why not? Because it's, it's not too hard to do, okay. both of them, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't give you a zero. I'm not going to count off if you don't do lowercase, but it'd be awesome, so why not?